Welcome to this episode of Revolution and Ideology. This is Nick. This episode is the second in a series of conversations with Jonathan Dickinson and Dimitri Mugianis about psychedelics. If you haven't listened to the first episode, I highly, highly suggest that you do so. We go over sort of the history of psychedelics as used by the state as tools of control and oppression. The second episode we uh, kind of wide ranging, really. We talk about a wide range of topics. The focus is the liberatory potential of psychedelics and the impacts that they can have in social organizing and challenging the system uh, and so forth. So the second part uh, in our two part series with Jonathan Dickinson and Dimitri Mugianis. Of those problematic issues. Interesting that the problematic issues aren't actual Nazis, but hippies. Um, and so they want to distance themselves from from from, from that hippie, the, the narrative, the, the sort of hippie culture or the freak left. Um, and the narrative is that what happened is psychedelic research got off the rails, and you'll hear that often, um, because of these crazy practices that were uh, attached to liberatory practices, um, sort of totally ignoring the war on drugs and the main focus of the war on drugs was, of course, to, 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 give, um, uh, 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 to give reason uh, and uh, power to increasing the police state politically, um, uh, specifically, I should say, um, to targeting black people and also targeting leftists, which is often left out of the conversation. It was designed to target leftists. Nixon said, we'll make it about, quote, the blacks. But they were also talking about the hippies with weed. And what they meant by hippies was not some sort of, you know, flower child. What they were really talking about was, um, was these liberatory movements. And so what the, the, what the psychedelic renaissance has sought to do in distancing themselves from that, that, that history um, is to place the use of psychedelics uh, strictly in a medical, um, uh, psychiatric um, um, uh, container, as if psychi psychiatry is apolitical and psychiatry doesn't have so much to do with 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 uh, with with the police state and 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 um, and sort of a, 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 a oppression. I mean, not totally, but but largely to do. And you guys could go into. Foucault and, and, and others and, and talk about that. And what they're really doing is they're, they're focusing on pathologies. For instance, there's a lot around um, PTSD, um, which we, we wrote about a little bit. There's a lot around so-called um, treatment resistant depression. And I've heard you guys talk about this, uh, you know, um, uh, on the podcast um, about this sort of rise in depression and rise in PTSD. And, and there's, there's no sort of um, uh, focus um, on why um, there's an increased uh, uh, um, um, uh, incidence of so-called mental illness. And so the idea is to focus on PTSD, which doesn't talk about alienation in the old fashioned Marxist way or, or the, the water that we're swimming in that makes us so sick. And we're just going to sort of fix the individual fix the problem that lies within them to make them productive members of society. And this is sort of the narrative of, of psychedelics now, but there is a liberatory history for sure. It's funny you mentioned that. I just saw this article like this week or last week about some scientists, like biosocial scientists, and the title of the article was whatever, but the point was that <clears throat> they had proven that there's a correlation between this rise in depression, et cetera, like you just mentioned, and like external stimuli, right, is a scientific term, meaning society is causing this. And I was like, and this was like earth shattering. And I'm like, people have been saying this for decades and decades, right? Like this is not new. When are we going to finally start having this conversation for real, you know? Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> we, I mean, we're working on, on putting together an episode on the quote unquote stimulus struggle from, of course, like, mm -hmm. you know, this, 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 this sixties work by, uh, why is his name escaping me right now, Nick? Anyway, Morris, Desmond yeah, Morris, Desmond Morris and, uh, his work with the human zoo. And while, like I said, we don't, we, it, 
we're treading in some dangerous waters. And I think he was as well, like kind of crossing like different species and his observation. He's more of a, like I said, looking at animals and then like crossing that over and claiming that humans as animals and, and we are animals, but like talking about that stimulus struggle and some of his um, earlier conclusions are like, yes, this is, and I'm, I'm, I'm paraphrasing here in my words, not his, that, that, that part of this leads to unsustainable, like psychological uh, basically interaction with the world around them, or, or maybe I should better frame that. Like the world around them is leading to psychological issues um, that, uh, that, that didn't exist prior mm-hmm. um, leading to then unsustainable practices that we're talking about here uh, in this right. episode. Yeah. And there isn't, there, there's a distancing themselves from that, right. Going right to quote unquote science as sort of scientism. Um, yeah. And, and then, and then they kind of walk this sort of strange line between like the scientism and then this weird apolitical mysticism. And, you know, I'm a, I'm a spiritual person, I'm a religious person, but I understand that, that we have to do work on the ground. Um, and so there's this idea that is also in the mix that by simply taking this, by taking ayahuasca on the weekends, by doing a mushroom journey every four months, that we will change ourselves and therefore change the collective. But there is no analysis of what needs to be changed and how that changes. And so it's sort of that new age hippie stuff. And you see it in the early, earlier, earlier sort of dropout. Um, uh, like I mentioned in the last episode, there's a uh, a, a sort of a startling um, um, uh, conversation on William Buckley's program with with Timothy Leary, um, which is which is basically tell, in telling people the tune out part seems like go to sleep, simply take this acid, go live in a commune, and things will change. And we sort of hear it all the time in the psychedelic space that we are elevating consciousness, that we are bringing a rise to it. It has a lot to do, I believe, with um, sort of American exceptionalism. There's also a generational exceptionalism that b- comes out of American exceptionalism. And I think that it sort of reaches its uh, conclusion or this conclusion uh, in the psychedelic space with spiritual exceptionalism and elitism. And there's not really much conversation or action, although there are some notable exceptions and we'll get to those. Um, around uh, around sort of organizing and resistance uh, leading to revolution. Yeah, I mean, we we in 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 what we talk about both in classrooms and on this podcast, especially Nick, he'll speak more to this in just a moment. But this idea of like revolutionary exit is what it sounds like a lot of what was going on. Like, like can we change society? Can we voice our concerns through society through just leaving? And I shouldn't use the word voice because if we're going to reference Aberly, voice. Um, loyalty and exit are the three frameworks that he looks at like revolutionary processes and exit seems to be the one you're alluding to that was used during this time period, like this exit from society um, to go on journeys, both material and ideal using these psychedelics. um, That was the way to, or the purported way to make change. Nick, do you want to add anything to that? Yeah, I think you said Haverly, but it's Hirschman that is exit voice loyalty. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it also reminds me when Dimitri was saying all that of Bookchin, you know, lifestyle versus social anarchism and his harsh critiques of basically the hippies and the prefiguration movements of people leaving society and living in communes and doing the work on themselves as individuals and having the expectation in his mind that the, you know, delusion that that was going to result in a changed system. Um, I mean, it's the same critique, right? Um, and Buchner was writing around the same time that this kind of stuff was happening, you know? Yeah, heavily yeah. influenced by Murray, for sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think the, the perception is that bringing these substances into the system will create some kind of change. And even, so we, we referenced back last week to... Um, the Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, there's a lot of levels of what they're doing and and sort of working with the FDA and trying to advance medicine. I think one of the guiding sort of visions of Rick Doblin, who's the director of that, 
is this idea that he's going to bring MDMA to world religious leaders and that somehow or another this will help to dissolve religious boundaries and, and world conflict and, and lead to this slow slowing down of the, the war machine. So I, I think like this is how it's, how it's contextualized. But I think what actually we're witnessing is then all of this energy that could be put towards revolutionary politics or other kinds of movement building is just getting directed towards this and really just doing like you were, um, you already covered Mark Hughes, but really it's just putting um, capitalism in control or administration of all these other aspects of life and subjectivity. And in the process, even extending what, you know, the powers of state institutions like psychiatry a little bit more into the, the spiritual and these other, other aspects of our subjective life. And by making the narratives focus solely on individual improvement and growth and so on, it removes it from the discourse on creating systemic social change, right? Like you said, it removes the revolutionary narrative from the substances altogether, which of course is their goal. The container in which we're doing this is well, you know, late stage capitalism, or however you want to frame where we are right now, um, and it's sort of like the, the the naivete and unscientific approach that these folks are having is is staggering. What it's what it's first of all, one of the things it's it's it's, it's saying is that we can we can alleviate or or eliminate the pain from a consumer society by creating this product. So the way out of a consumer society is by ingesting this product. We see folks going into a journey. It's less so now, but back when there was no chance of this thing ever being, or seemingly no chance of this stuff ever being legalized. We see folks going into an Ibogaine session, ayahuasca, uh, mushrooms, whatever, having this incredible breakthrough experience. And then earnestly, and I think from a good heart, thinking, how do we get this to the FDA? Mm -hmm. That's the only container in which folks are able are able to um, to sort of process this. So the, the naivete is that this container that we are all swimming in is malleable in turn to a mal. It is malleable and it is plastic, but not not in the way, not in an expansive revolutionary evolutionary way. It, it, it will absorb every fucking thing, as, as you guys know, including this. And this can be used as a way of, I think, for one thing, of course, the people that were shocked at first. The shrinks love this. The psychiatrists love this. Well, of course they did. They are used to like prescribing medicines that they don't know if they'll work, how they'll work, and who they'll work for, and giving it great claims. It's also going to prop up their industry for another 20 years. Um, and, and I'll give you an example of um, this idea, this sort of naivete that's incredibly offensive. I think I might have mentioned it last episode. One of the things Rick Doblin and Maps want is, is working on, and there's a guy out of, I think, Oxford, I can't think of an Israeli uh, um, um, a researcher. They want to give ayahuasca in group setting to both Palestinians and Israelis together. Um, there is so much that is offensive about that and potentially damaging about that. Uh, and, and it shows the level of political critique. The problem is there's just, just some kind of misunderstanding that could be healed through a psychedelic journey. And you, you hear people like, you know, as much as I love, I don't know if you guys are familiar with um, Terrence McKenna. Mm -hmm. um, he's brilliant, but he got this stuff absolutely wrong. He, you know, he's one of my favorite philosophers. What he would go on about was that, you know, we simply need to give ayahuasca to all the world leaders was one of his things. The other thing was that, you know, I saw a beautiful talk about sort of, you know, resistance that ended with you simply need to take psychedelics and make art. You need to have an analysis just as if you're coming into a process for some sort of healing. It would be helpful if you had an analysis. 
So this is where the nonspecific amplifiers that we talked about in the last episode will come in, will, will be useful because we can use these things. I believe, and I think we can show historically that psychedelics can be used as an organizing tool. There's a lot of reasons for that. For one, it takes a lot of time. So you have a lot of time with folks. It's inefficient in that way. There's a bonding when it's done in a group. And, and if it's done over time with a specific agenda, I believe folks can, can, can sort of come to some sort of um, organizing principle or, 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 or organize around it. And we can show historically, and maybe we should get into that a little bit. Yeah, I mean, I think that just before, like, I, I think we, we can dig into some of the examples of how it, how it does work. I think one of the things is that there's so much potential energy that's being redirected into supporting the Renaissance as it's being formulated by psychiatry. Partly because I think people, I, I, I can say from my own experience. So when I went to psychedelics, I was in a lot of pain and it helped me a lot. And I think a lot of that pain, like we talked about, came from this sense of disenfranchisement and alienation and um, sort of real things that happened as a result of that. Um, and somehow was seduced by the idea that if I can watch those medicines become more accepted by the people I feel disenfranchised by and alienated by, then somehow that represents this sort of conclusion of that. And so I think it's, it is, I think it, I think it requires an analysis because what I've actually come to realize now is that by trying to advance that, that agenda, I'm just further um, alienating myself or, or, or contributing to those forces of alienation that, that capital produces. So, um, so I guess the question is, like, I think at some point we'll have to talk about Mark Fisher, mm -hmm. who is a British blogger, and he wrote this book, um, Acid Communism, or he, sorry, he, when he passed away, he was in the process of writing this book, Acid Communism. So it was an unfinished manuscript that he was working on. And so at one point in there, he asked the question, what if the counterculture was just the stumbling beginning rather than just the best that could be hoped for? And so I think even, you know, the, the psychedelic renaissance wants to paint the 60s or 70s as sort of naive or or missing the mark. And even if we accept that and just take it as a stumbling beginning, um, can't does it still have revolutionary potential to include psychedelic consciousness in revolutionary politics and movements? Yeah, I think that people often, you know, exactly like he said, it, the global 60s and all of the different issues that were being fought for at the time not like that struggles ended there's it's still continuing but you know what i mean they people look back and say wow that was like the height of the struggle against capitalist state you know hegemony on and on and like you know like fisher said and you mentioned that that's as good as it gets i think people lose sight of the fact that it's very possible. In fact, I would say that it's probable that the global 60s were just like a blip of what the movement that would be required to change capitalist hegemony, the totality of what that would need to look like, right? Like it's a very, very just minor glimpse in sort of the schism that will be required to change society as we know it and achieve all of the goals uh, that people are fighting for, I think. Um, so rather than it being, you know, like, wow, that was it. That was the height of the struggle. And like, what do we go from there? It's like, wow, that was like, we just got a little bit of insight to the level of how much society will change uh, if we can actually be successful in achieving some of these things, you know, throughout time. But then we have to always be concerned, right? Especially when these are more like individualized solutions or revolutionary aggregate or even attached to prefiguration that these things don't end up getting like consumed and regurgitated and repackaged by the machine itself, right? I'm reminded of a, a film I showed, 
like on the first day of class, it kind of blows a lot of students' minds. It's not my film. It's about four minutes. I recommend you watch it. It's called Happiness by Steve Cutts. It's a cute little cartoon that kind of basically takes, and it is only four minutes long, and it makes some of the similar arguments of like the Marcuses and, 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 uh, and Hirschman's and so on and so forth in four minutes. It actually, it, 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 it makes it quite smaller. Long story short, it, it uses the metaphor of the rat race. These rat cartoon rats are running around consuming and everywhere they're looking for happiness. They're told that if they buy the car, they're happy. They're told if they uh, uh, buy uh, whatever TVs on Black Friday, they're happy. They're told that if they uh, just go to work and follow all the rules, they're happy. But what they realize is that happiness is not sustainable. So eventually one of these rats kind of breaks out and decides, okay, well, none of this has made me happy. So then I look to a different kind of happiness that society tells me to look at. The first one's alcohol. And he, that rat consumes alcohol until it passes out. And then the rat is no longer happy again. The next one, and the one we're talking about here, this rat eventually finds prescription happiness, i.e. something that, that has now been taken. I don't know. It's, it's a gen, generic prescription. We can call it uh, Xanax or Ritalin or whatever. The rat takes that. And there is this momentarily momentary reprieve. But once that rat comes back down, that rat is back in the rat race. And to get more of that product, that rat then has to go back to work. And literally, the rat ends up caught in a mousetrap. And it's kind of a funny image. And that mousetrap has the rat working in like a giant cubicle with a computer only so that the rat can achieve more currency to buy more of that, that prescription to get that escape. So it's acting more in this case, in this critique as a coping me mechanism to merely sustain the labor of a capitalist society so just so they can get through their average workday rather than actually liberate them. And I, I like that metaphor quite a bit that he uses. I'm not saying it's like, you know, it's a four minute cartoon that there are no holes in it whatsoever. But I do think that's a danger that we often see a lot of revolutionary like ideals or movements go through is oftentimes they end up becoming um, part of the state themselves. Right. Like, uh, you know, we, we can talk about like the punk movement or the hip hop movement or these movements that were very like anti-state and now used by the state or uh, uh, greater capital and corporations to merely um, perpetuate their control over society, right? We go from 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 public enemy to using hip hop to sell detergent now. Like, how does that happen? The same could be said for really any sort of liberatory movement, not not just picking specifically on drugs. I think drug, uh, 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 psychedelics are a little bit more dangerous. To kind of continue on that, um, living in in, in Colorado um, and 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 visiting Oregon and Washington quite frequently, we even see this happening with 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 THC, right? We see that that it. I mean, the control is there at this point. This is now this is now a product. Um, it, it's even beyond a coping mechanism at this point. It's gone from coping mechanism to product. And, and of course, we're not talking specifically about marijuana in this podcast. We're talking about psychedelics, but we can already see that taking place. Yeah, the, the marijuana industry is such a good, I, I think it's like a good precursor to what is in store for the psychedelic industry if right. it becomes fully commodified, right? Like billions of dollars of venture capital funding and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? It's already happening. If you if you think about, um, God, I'm going to, is it Anslinger, um, the, uh, the drug war uh, architect in the Anslinger? If you think about what his fears were and what happened, I mean, he was afraid that, you know, of course, you know, wh white woman's virtues always at the center of all these things. And, you know, reading this stuff, he was like, you know, what will happen is the youths will smoke this and listen to the, quote, jungle beats of jazz and then, become, you know, some sort of white Negro. And you're looking at that and like, if only, if only that was going to happen. He didn't really have enough faith in his own fucking system and his own witchcraft uh, or sorcery, I should say. Yeah. Um, and, and that's, that's, that's what we, so the, the, that's what we have to look for because the psychedelic aspect of it in terms of the outward psychedelics, in terms of fashion and music and the wah-wah pedal, and all this stuff became, became, you know, just part of the, of the, of the narrative. And right now it's happening again. I think it's actually, is it Gucci? That's got all these psychedelic stuff happening now with mush sort of mushroomy stuff on the, on the fucking $20,000 bags or something like that. Um, I, I, there's a bit in the Mark Fisher in, in, in the, where he, where he sort of, where he goes into psychedelic shack by the uh, temptations and Psychedelic Shack is sort of describing this utopian space 
you know, uh, where, you know, it, it is the exit strategy, but uh, and, which I think is it, it's really well worth reading that, that intro that he, that he wrote. Um, but without digressing too much, like, how do we keep it from going there? Um, how do we, it, it, for what we also, we have to remember that they're starting out by saying, we don't want that. I think we read uh, the, the thing from, um, from, uh, from uh, Johns Hopkins last time, right? Like, we don't want that. So they're starting out saying that this will, they're saying that we're going to give it to religious leaders and world leaders, and eventually it's going to change consciousness. We've seen that didn't happen when yoga was introduced into the structure. It didn't happen when Tai Chi or acupuncture was introduced into the structure. It becomes a product. Is it possible for, for us to sort of continue on, to, to like continue that work, that start, that maybe never even stopped really, because there, there's, there's all kinds of stuff. And they're also calling it a renaissance and this has been happening for a long time. And I think, you know, just to get to like some of the stuff that, that Jonathan and I, I had talked about, if you look at, if you look at Bwiti, which is in Central Africa, now this wasn't an overtly political movement, but there's a great book on, I think it's called Farm Bwiti. It's by, um, is it James Fernandez? Yeah, it's called Bwiti, the Religious Imagination of Africa. And by the, the, it's a great anthropologist of Iboga. Um, and, um, and what he talks about, and I, and I think there's some, some clues that we could look to. Um, and, and Jonathan, uh, I think you probably read it more recently than I have. I think I read it maybe 20 years ago. Um, what, what, what he talks about is he, he, he takes the Fang, who are a particular um, ethnic group, uh, the, the largest ethnic group in Gabon, um, and the one most favored by the colonialists for whatever fucking reasons they pick favorites. I mean, obvious reasons, there's a strategic reason for that. Um, but uh, they were the last to come to this thing called Bwiti, which is um, briefly the, the, the ingestion of um, the, the spirituality and religion that grew up around the ingestion of Iboga, with Iboga as the central sacrament. This is in Gabon, Central Africa, in parts of Cameroon. Iboga as a central, uh, central sacrament, um, the pharmacopoeia of the forest, and then, and then the performing arts as healing arts. Um, and uh, what he talked about is Fang people coming to it maybe a hundred years ago, 100 to 60 years ago. And they were coming into it because they came into contact with other um, ethnic groups in Gabon, what is called Gabon, which is a colonial distinction, colonial lines, obviously. They came into it when they were working in the so-called plantations. And these men and women, uh, the women who had been, um, uh, there was a, a lot of um, miscarriages and, and women who were infertile because of uh, the, um, the uh, venereal disease brought by the French. And I guess the French brings special venereal disease from what I understand. But um, uh, there, was, there, was, there, there, there was this sort of um, losing um, their, 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 their personhood, their womanhood, their, their, their sort of job, their place in the society because they couldn't bear children and the men being sent off to do work that was not the type of work that they were used to for thousands of years, which means that the, the, the great gift of the forest, right? it, was a, it was a forger, hunter, gatherer type of, of, of society. And so then they were labeled as lazy, um, uh, uh, the sort of the man of the village or the family became the boy. And when they went and started to work with other ethnic groups, which there was antagonism between them, antagonism between them, initially and historically, and when they met there was, they, they were introduced to this thing called Bwiti. And in the Bwiti, everyone has work. Everyone has a job. I'm going to screw it up. Is it Traver? Or every Traver de Buiti or something like that? Did I fuck that up, Jonathan? Probably. Um, but the job of the Buiti. And what he talked about was people finding their place, finding themselves, and finding meaning in being able to be in contribution. The things that we all get to do. Um, all four of us get to be in contribution, therefore giving our lives meaning. 
So everyone in Bleeti has a job that helps the individual that's going through the three-day process get over. And they were also doing this sort of underground. Um, and so it was an act of, of resistance to colonialism. And, and it was also giving meaning around the organization of the ingestion of this, of this, of what they consider, and I consider a sacrament, but we can say a drug. Yeah. I Anything mean, else? Yeah, I, I think there's a lot of really good examples. I mean, they were able to reform a sense of community identity around the rituals. And there's some aspects of it that are syncretic in really interesting ways. Like it's a mixture of this sort of um, pygmy use of Iboga with the Bantu rituals, which maybe have some sort of thread back to Egypt. You know, like that, that was part of the big first migration um, through Africa. And so there is this ritualization now happening around Iboga that wasn't happening before. That's what we're talking about. It's maybe 100, 150 years old. But there's some elements of that ritual that seem to be sort of taking reflections from the written tradition that came in the form of the Bible that was brought by the colonizers. So they were looking at Genesis and, oh, they're talking about the tree. Here's the tree. They're talking about the, the garden where everything originated. Here we are. And um, this tree that gives access to this, this sense of knowledge. And then sort of after Eden is closed, God places this cherubim with a flaming sword that spins in all directions. So the closing of the ritual is this torch that people dance with and there's fl sparks flying everywhere and, fl and, and fire. And so I, I think they, there's some elements of that written tradition that were almost co-opted by in order to like in a way that empowered their their sense of groundedness in in place and having access to something directly that even the the colonizers and the outside outsiders were looking for or, or claiming to so i think there's a lot of ways that that identity was really strengthened. Um, it's, I think it's I think it's a good example. I think that the worldview and the, the cosmology is extremely powerful, and it's helped to resist the onslaught of you know capitalism and colonialism and help people to to survive it for sure. I mean, it makes me think of one. Um, there's an anthology that you shared at one point, Dimitri, Afro-Pessimism. And so in, a, in one of the intro chapters, they were saying that um, sort of Black people have experienced this kind of social death or they're this sort of, in order to be brought into the world of capital and power, have to... Are, I mean, face real death along the, the journey, but then have this sort of death of identity and have been inviting revolutionaries and people for a long time into this, what they call the dance of social death. And so one thing that it makes me think of is like maybe if there's any use in sort of a revolutionary movement, it's not only to see the, you know, psychedelics ability to be able to help us tolerate exploitation and alienation in order to live in society, but to be able to help us tolerate exploitation, and alienation, to be able to lean into it a little bit and to feel it and understand it and understand where it's coming from and how to respond to it. I think that's actually a really good point because you know, the Renaissance, like we talked about in the past, the previous episode is really touting the benefit for treating PTSD and so on, and specifically for the military, right? But if we are seriously talking about a revolution that's so powerful that it can challenge capitalist hegemony, I think we need to be honest with the fact that that's going to be a traumatic experience for those that directly experience that right so i think there can be a role for psychedelics to help ease that experience uh as well you know yeah absolutely 
you know, this is the problem of, of sort of revolutionary wellness movement and, you know, to see how that was co-opted. I mean, that even the, the concept of wellness, you can, I think it's in color purple. Do you want to, uh, do you want to be well? You know, there's, a, there's, this, there's this beautiful exchange. Um, and, it, 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 and wellness, and I think psychedelics is kind of finding its way into the capitalist version of it, where, you know, where they want to make it a product, but there's those of us who have been giving, you know, who create space. Um, so people suffering from it, it's what um, I've been listening to um, Joy James quite a bit, which call, talks about the captive maternal. And uh, it's not a gendered idea, and I'm not going to try to do it justice because I won't be able to. But this idea that there's a few different phases, and the first one is the captive maternal takes care of the people that are harmed, you know. And and then there's the then then they then the captive maternal will you know once maybe go out into the street, you know, to demonstrate, and then the captive maternal will hopefully engage in whatever struggle is necessary in order so we don't have to do the first fucking thing to begin with right um and we spend a lot of our time in that first phase of the captive maternal i think you know we all do by you know working for nonprofits on the grassroots making sure people are are fed and you know and and and, and making sure that they are uh, touched in a medicinal way or just have community and and I think a lot of psychedelics can be used for that, like Jonathan was just talking about. But and, but we do have examples of it being used in 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 organizing in revolutionary ways. I think um, uh, the first would be you know the black that I would point to is the, and the one that's not really known that much is that the Black Panthers' use of LSD and other and other psychedelics um, was almost a, a requirement, especially for although we're not vanguardist here, but especially for um, uh, top leadership. Um, it was directly influenced in, in, in the 10 points, right in the 10 points. Um, we could, the Weather Underground would engage in communal consumption of LSD and also you know, sex um, as a way, as an organizing uh, uh, principle. Um, um, uh, the, the White Panther Party was a... Was a um, um, was uh, also using it directly, and you know, uh, John Sinclair is a good friend of mine. And if you ask him what what were the conditions um, that you know that created the material conditions, he said part of it was LSD um, in order uh, to uh, be able to maybe see outside of this box and and to see a collective. Um, those are the ones I, po I I can point to right right off the bat. Yeah. So. I mean, I might be oversimplifying the last little bit and some things that Jonathan mentioned kind of like really, like really spoke to me. And it made me go back and think of like another another source that Nick and I have referenced before. It's not even one of our favorite sources, but 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 it works. It's uh, the end of protest by Michael White and his idea that there are four different sections um, of revolutionary process that must come together for absolute revolutionary change. This is a, his, his argument in, in a nutshell. And the reason why we haven't seen revolutionary change on the scale that we're looking for is we've never brought all four pieces together. The first two are, are, are pretty obvious for like academics that study revolution. The first is structuralist. So the conditions have to be right. The larger macro conditions just have to be right, whatever that is, climate change, economic degradation, whatever. The second part uh, will also be familiar to both of you, volunteerism. You have to have boots on the ground, people that are willing to make sacrifices and actually like be in the streets making those change changes. The other two is what we're kind of diving into right now, and specifically the third quadrant, which is called subjectivism, a change in the mindset. Now, none of these can stand alone is his argument. And, and I, I think that's what we're seeing here is that, that at least from what I've been listening to for the last you know, like few minutes here is that, that, that by itself, merely um, taking psychedelics is not going to cause any sort of revolutionary change right, to like the larger systems in place. More, more than likely, obviously, if we all remain uh, in our own individual silos, taking our psychedelics and maybe having some sort of enhanced experiences or maybe even healing to cope with the toxicity of our system, that does, again, that, that ends up being more of a coping mechanism um, just so that eventually we can be healed enough to get back into the system, right? That's, that's how it's being used right now. 
But if it can be, and this is what Jonathan, I think, was saying, part of the organization process for volunteerism to be prepared for the structuralist changes, that might be its most revolutionary potential to actually be able to see outside of our, our socialized purviews, right, our lenses, the literal like mental shackles that we're within. And I think that's what I'm hearing, that, that by itself, psychedelic movement, this renaissance is, is merely, it's not going to get it done. It needs to be part of these other processes or help and aid in those other processes. His fourth quadrant, we won't get into. It's our biggest hang up with his theory. It's called theorism that some other worldly power has to kind of step in as well. I, that's one of the reasons we don't use it as much anymore. But, but those three quadrants, I, I think he makes a good point in. So anyway, any thoughts on that? I think that we can see, thank you for that, because that's really clear and um, helping me think about what, you know, what is to be done, as they say. Uh, I think that um, currently um, in that third quadrant, uh, Extinction Rebellion is an example, maybe, and uh, you, you guys are familiar with them, right? Um, uh, they, they grew out of... Um, out of somebody's Ibogaine trip, where they 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 made that leap into where their, their thoughts were actually the thought was already there. I believe she had an analysis, and then she took that into the street. So I'm just thinking as a real practical like example of what's happening right now. That and that's you know I mean their ultimate goal is to is to move us all to where we don't leave the fucking square and totally change. And 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 um, and I think that gives me a lot of a lot of hope, um, um, and, and um, that to see it actually happening now. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So that you're you're talking about um, Dr. Gail Bradbrook, and I mean that that story of there being psychedelic inspiration behind that is pretty widely published by now, but. Um, yeah, I think that sometimes those experiences can be that kind of sort of synthesizing of, of views and visions or helping to arrive at shared, even shared experiences, but certainly like finding ways to be able to, to communicate them, for sure. It seems like that's, that's how she used it. Yeah, and I think that, you know, the danger is just like with all drugs like, like we're talking about you know funneling through the fda and etc is that it stops at being an individual exercise right an individual experience it's the the self-help and the improving myself and changing the way that i think and i feel and i experience the world and so forth but that's only you know one part of if this is going to the goal is revolutionary potential Right, it must grow and extend beyond that. Um, and I like Dimitri's points earlier about how it can contribute to organizing, right? Creating solidarity. Um, there's solidarity in you know these experiences and taking part in this sort of underground uh, action. And you know, talking about the African culture specifically, that example of how everyone in the ritual has a job, right? A quote unquote job. They have a role that they perform. And so there's a sense of belonging and it rebuilds this sort of communal experience, which like, obviously, let's be honest, has been just eroding away over time underneath, you know, advanced industrial society uh, and so forth. So I think that, the, the, yeah, the danger that we want to avoid if this is our goal is making it purely individualistic, right? Purely a self-help piece. And we've seen how this has gone, like you mentioned earlier with, you know, meditation and yoga and uh, you know, Jared mentioned Xanax earlier and so forth, that we never, we ignore the conversation of, you know, why is this necessary and what are the actual causes? We're merely treating it individual sy symptoms, right? That's what the drugs get, uh, get reduced to. <laughs> you know, you mentioned earlier, like Dimitri, I think it was, you know, wanting naively you know fda approval and i think we all need to sort of just recognize that if if the path to your revolution is through the fda you're on the wrong path you know what i mean like that's not going to happen it's not going to end well uh if that's what we're looking at you know <laughs> i think that's definitely part of what 
has to be resisted for anybody who is working with with psychedelics is over individualizing the problem and the application. I, I think there's a lot of other kind of examples to look at, like Dimitri, you've been talking about social medicine. Um, so I mean, the individual has a place in the community and individual sense of alienation and like healing from exploitation and oppression. It has a place in there, but um, like the, the pillars of social medicine would include being able to like deeply accompany each other through the, the space and the time that gets opened up. And then also having a structural analysis about, I guess, about illness, but mm -hmm. in general about health and, and personal growth. And then, um, you know, being able to make sure that it's actually being accessible for people who, who need it. Like, I mean, one, one thing it makes me think of is how flat some of the, um, some of the research looks when you take it outside the, the context that it's being studied in right now. For example, when you're looking at PTSD to treat Israeli soldiers, you can sort of treat it like an individual problem because they're going home to a system that otherwise supports them and provides safety and, and whatever. When you're looking at Palestine, it, it just like you can't you can't look at that context without having the context of social medicine. Mm -hmm. Like it just it's completely flat. So I think I think those who are working with psychedelics need definitely need to resist that sort of individualization of illness or, or whatever it is that that's happening. So, I mean, what would you guys say to someone, because this is, they clearly have a lot of voices right now, right? That is pushing for the medicalization They're right? They're pushing for F the FDA path. Like, what are the dangers of this? What are they not understanding about, you know, what are they giving up by pursuing this path? You just brought up a couple of, uh, that what Jonathan was talking about just kind of leads into this for me right now. So think about a medical path is it's what we're doing is that we're, we're going to the beauty of, of research and, we're, and we're, I've used research in quotes because we don't know what research is, but let's just say research is about, it's about reduction to find that thing sort of, and, to, and, and so we're, it's a really reductionist process to find one thing and to target that one thing. And in the movements I've been involved in, I've watched this medicalization, you know, 12 steps really helped me. I don't buy everything that has to do with it, but 12 steps legitimized itself through, by calling it a disease and medicalizing it. And then what happens? It just becomes all about medicalizing. So it's, it's the disease of addiction instead of a process that someone's going through that's very different. It's a disease because they want to make it, you know, acceptable and billable. And I, I get the strategy. The same thing happened in the harm reduction movement, which I've been involved in, which really saved my life. Like we could prove that if you give out needles to people, that the rate of HIV is going to drop. If we give ed education and condoms, we're going to drop that. If we, if we give overdose prevention, we're going to drop that. That's great, but what happens is the place that used to be opened by a bunch of run by a bunch of uh, queer activists and other anarchists would act up, and all these people where every day, every Wednesday, where they would close down and do everybody's hair, you know, that becomes less and less important. And what becomes more and more important is that we deliver as many syringes as possible, and we and we can sort of patch up the injuries of the drug wars, but the injuries of the drug wars and the injuries of capitalism and racism and homophobia and sexism and all that stuff. And that becomes the focus. This will not be a way in, this will become the whole thing. You can look at, you know, it just came to me when Jonathan was talking, you know, uh, Upton Sinclair, Upton Sinclair? Uh, the Jungle, right? Is that right? Yeah. He wrote this book about capitalism and about the destruction of humanity. In, in, in the meat in the meat packing plants and what and what happened is it became about the the it, it became, instead of like hitting the, the whole the, the world with this like we have to stop treating people this way and this horrible conditions in the Chicago meat packing plants it became about sanitary conditions this famous quote is I aim for the heart and I hit the belly and then I could also point to like 
you know, the work that I'm, that I'm blessed to be a part of in, um, in, in Harlem, here in Harlem, in East Harlem, and at the organization I work at, we have a, we have a wellness center that offers acupuncture and, 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 and massage and, and sound therapy and yoga. It's part of a, of a harm reduction center. It sort of happened by accident. It's amazing. And we're working with, with my friends and I consider elders who are part of the Young Lords. And the Young Lords were, for those who don't know, it was a revolutionary sort of a sister organization or similar organization in the Black Panthers for, for Puerto Rican people. And they were anti-capitalist, anti-patriarchy, anti-homophobic. Anti I mean, they were doing good work. And their lasting legacy is the Patient's Bill of Rights, which is important because they took over Lincoln Hospital and they also introduced acupuncture, right, for active drug users. Now, every harm reduction site in New York, and if you ever did auricular acupuncture, you can thank a young lord for that. Those are just Puerto Rican men and women and other people who were just, you know, learning about, how, you know, sort of people's medicine, but it becomes about, it just becomes about that. And the anti-capitalism aspect of it is completely lost. The liberatory aspect of it is completely lost. It is the nature of what we're sort of giving ourselves over to. Medicalization is science. It's going to reduce and reduce and reduce. And then we put it into a capitalist context and any revolutionary as uh, aspects are lost. Is, is it a complete loss? Probably not. There's acupuncture, people are getting acupuncture. The needle exchanges are legal, but for any sort of challenge, and these are often revolutionary people, myself included, that were active in these struggles. You know, for my age, it was, it was you know, act up and drug policy and all that stuff. But I realized that th as my beard gets grayer, that I've spent a lot of time, and, and I think some of it was worthwhile, but a lot of time was just trying to get the FDA with some shit that I don't believe in to begin with. Um, and, and any real evolutionary potential be, just, just is diminished. Everyone, every, virtually every country in the world has a harm reduction component to it. Is it success? Maybe. But what we were seeing was a bunch of queers and junkies and, and, and sort of outsiders wanting to change the fucking world. And that didn't happen. Yeah, I, I um, want to give a shout out because you brought up the, the 12 steps that have helped me a lot too. But in terms of um, like revolutionary movements and even talking about social, social medicine inspired by psychedelic experiences, it's such a good example. Bill, Bill W. had psychedelic experiences that were part of his so bill w is the, the founder of aa and some of his psychedelic experiences and and later you know he was working a lot with with lsd you know with people through the aa community and stuff like that and um i mean i think it would be hard to ignore that they played some role in inspiring how the the 12 steps and the 12 traditions came together and the, the 12 traditions is a beautiful model for community organizing that creates a distributed, non-hierarchical, non-professionalized way of people coming together to support each other. And I think that, you know, I'm, I, I know other people have said it, but I do think that, you know, the, the 12 steps is one of the most important spiritual technologies that came out of the, the 20th century. It's a, it's a beautiful working model it doesn't necessarily get everybody sober that goes in the door, but it's a beautiful self-organizing model. The, the, the 12 traditions you mean? The 12 traditions, yes. Yeah, it's, it's, it's psychedelic and anarchist inspired. I mean, yeah. I don't know if you guys know that, but, uh, <laughs> but, but uh, Bill W. was influenced, amongst others, the noble prince, as he sort of cryptically referred to him, the noble Russian prince. Um, uh, and so he was very influenced by anarchist thought, kind of kept on the down low. If you look at what we've sort of written here, we have the beatniks, the Black Panthers, Weather Underground, White Panthers, LSD, Rave Culture, House Culture, Queer Culture, Freak Lab. All of these movements had psychedelics either as an essential component or part of it, right? In these notes that we're looking at here. So then the question is, were those movements revolutionary? That's the question. And the, the, I think we would have to go through 
and th th there's some differentiating. I mean, some of our, some were, some were. Some had an impact on societal attitudes that made people's lives in way better, way better. I mean, mm -hmm. harm reduction made drug use. I mean, we're, you know, quick, but did it challenge the economic structure? So the answer for some of that is no. And the ones that went for capital at capital were crushed, but they had the right idea. And we, I think that we have to blend the, them together. The, the beautiful thing about, about the, the revolutionary, the, the directly revolutionary groups that we talked about, all of them embraced sort of a legalization of drugs and, and embraced feminism and, and embraced um, a, a, a queer culture and queer revolution. So I think we have templates. And I think that we could use the templates from sort of everyone that I just named, you know, and, and those are broad and, and, and you guys get specifics, but we're speaking in broad, you, know, you always, you guys are really good at like always emphasizing that we're talking in broad strokes. So I'll say that. But if we could take, and we can take because we, if we are the, we are the, the they are our ancestors. We are the recipients of their struggle. We are the recipients of also their joy, right? And if we can sort of remove the capitalist filter in which it comes through us and get to the pure essence of it, and that essence is revolutionary joy and celebration of each other in rave culture and queer culture and punk culture, right? It's in celebration of each other and, 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 and not just building safe space, but building safe space so that we can, can use that safe space as a place for social medicine and revolutionary change. And I think it is possible. It hasn't stopped. We've been hit by the, by, they ain't no joke. Fucking, <laughs> what happened in the early 70s with neoliberalism and the decide, the, the they, they, that is no joke. What happened with that project was massive and it's crushing. And they knew that these things had something. All these movements had something that they needed to absorb or it was dangerous. So we need to requeer. We can't say we need to queer psychedelics. We need to requeer. We queer all of this stuff and bring back the, when they remove the transgression by making it legal, then they move some of the transition and the, and, and the transformative. We need to make this all transgressional, all transgressional against capital. And normative is not where we're at. We don't wanna be normal. We don't wanna be a part of this. Fuck this, fuck the FDA and fuck this culture. No, not fuck this culture, fuck the capitalization of this culture. Cause it's a beautiful fucking culture. It's a beautiful fucking culture. I love American culture. It's gorgeous, but they ain't fucking gonna swallow it up. We have to be aware. And I think, I think psychedelics can help us deal with the false consciousness of oneness. That they, that, like we are one, there is a communal, but that oneness is a, is a, a, a neoliberal version of it. There is no commons in that oneness and everything is as it should be. We can make everything as it should be. It ain't what's happening now. I can't think of a better closing thought on no, this. I mean, like, either. I was going to ask yeah. you guys if you had any closing thoughts, but I that's think it. That, that's it. I think Dimitri that's, killed that's, it. Yeah. yeah, that's the closing thought. Yeah, I mean, all, all I can say at this point is thank you guys for joining us. And I, I don't know if we mentioned it in the first episode, but you reached out to us and said, you know, hey, we're longtime listeners of the podcast. We would love to do episodes on this stuff that we know a lot about and we were all about it, right? So um, that wraps up the second one. So I, yeah, I just want to say thank you. Uh, Thanks, to the guys. two of you for educating us on this topic that we uh, definitely, definitely were uh, ignorant on. Why don't you tell actually the listeners where they can find your stuff? Because you've written a lot, uh, a lot of various uh, things <clears throat> about this topic. So where can they find you guys? Well, <laughs> I mean, it. we yeah. both we both have websites. Yeah, Dimitri, Dimitri, you can Google his name. Um, if you Google my name, it comes as a state park in Florida. <laughs> um, but <laughs> you can you can find me at my um my website seba ibogaine so it's c-e-i-b-a i-b-o-g-a-i-n-e.com and then on the blog there you'll see links to a bunch of our articles and we'll put this podcast up there too yeah and uh you should all can also look up new york harm reduction educators um which is in harlem which i'm really blessed to be working with and uh, yeah, you can just Google my name. I, my my website's not quite up to date, but there's random random rantings. 
<laughs> that you can find. Yeah. Um, there is something maybe you guys can help us with. Mm-hmm. Um, and we didn't even talk about this much, but like the stuff that was happening in the streets last summer um, and, uh, and what happened in the state, you know, the state house, there's this that fucking lunatic with the horns. And then that guy did a lot of ayahuasca and that's what he came to. Um, <laughs> mm-hmm. I mean, he had the right idea of storm that place, but for the total wrong reason, obviously. Um, but uh, we're trying to write about, um, about you know, sort of uh, uh, the revolutionary potential. And we want to talk to anybody who it was on the streets, anyone who, I don't know, a card-carrying member of Antifa, I mean, but who, who, also, who also does psychedelics. So if you all know anyone out, uh, you know, uh, 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 in, in your state, we really appreciate it. We're, 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 try, we're reaching out to a few folks and we kind of want to go directly against um, the narrative that MAPS is forming out there and say, actually, this stuff is dangerous. We want people to be afraid of it. So... <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Perfect. Yeah, so we'll, we, we'll put out the call and see uh, what we can drum up for sure. He outstormed that place, but for the total wrong reason, obviously. Um, but uh, we're trying to write about, um, about you know, sort of uh, uh, the revolutionary potential. And we want to talk to anybody who it was on the streets, anyone who... I don't know, a card carrying member of Antifa. I mean, but who who also who also does psychedelics. So if you all know anyone out, uh, you know, uh, 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 in in your state, we really appreciate it. We're 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 trying we're reaching out to a few folks, and we kind of want to go directly against um, the narrative that Maps is forming out there and say actually this stuff is dangerous. We want people to be afraid of it. So <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah, so we'll, think- we'll put out the call and see uh, what we can drum up for sure. So that does it for our second episode with Jonathan and Dimitri. Uh, we were so happy to have them on as guests. Um, like they requested, if you are consider yourself to be an activist that has some experience with psychedelics, they are writing extensively on this topic and would love to have a conversation with you. You can reach out to us and we can connect you. Uh, send us a message on Twitter or YouTube or Facebook or anywhere you can find us, or you can email us hello at revolutionandideology.com and we can connect you with uh, them. I think uh, many of our listeners might fit into uh, those categories. Uh, you can find us online at revolutionandideology.com, Twitter at Rev and Ideology. If you're listening to this in your podcasting app, know that we have a YouTube channel where we post all of our episodes and other videos that we create as well. You can just go to YouTube and search uh, Revolution and Ideology. If you really, really love what we do, you can support us on Patreon, patreon.com slash revolution and ideology. As always, thank you, thank you, thank you to our Patreon supporters. You keep us inspired and motivated to keep creating content as time allows. This is Nick. Later.